Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Sunday Matinee. I'm your host, Ben Stahl. We're on episode 44. Joining me this week to talk about Moon Knight is Miles McGillivray. Miles, welcome back. Thank you for having me. 44. Wow. Really? I know. know. So close. So close to 50. <laughs> Big numbers. Um, before I jump into anything, I uh, just want to say thank you to my dear friend, Sarah Moore, who two weeks ago hosted the His Dark Materials episode. That was uh, her idea, her pitch for an episode. I suggested that she should host it as well. She agreed. Um, and I, I really, I hope that that's something I'm going to see more of in the future is getting pitches from everyone to do stuff because otherwise we're just getting into my brain. And I know, I know my brain, a lot of those wavelengths, like the Marvel stuff gels with everybody, but you know, it's, it's great to bring some unique stuff to the table. Like I'd never thought to watch his dark materials until Sarah had suggested. So, and I liked it. So good. Thank you, Sarah, for that. And I look forward to have, I always look forward to having Sarah back on the show, but this week it's just me and miles and we're going to talk about moon Knight. but first some news. Um, this would actually be some very appropriate Sarah news to start us off. Um, the first trailer for the Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon, has dropped. So it's going to premiere August 21st. Um, I actually haven't watched that trailer yet. Have you? I have. Yeah. It was nice. It was good. It It's a teaser. So it's just got like, um, we are the Targaryens. We are the Starks. We are the Baratheons. You know, it seems like it's going back. Um, that's pretty much it. And it shows the main, the lead who looks really good. Um, it was kind of the first time I felt excited about Game of Thrones since the dark days of season eight. <laughs> <laughs> we needed the break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we got a break. Um, and... I, I don't know who the showrunners are, but I hope they've changed hands a bit and are allowing some other people to tell these stories because I think that'll help also get audiences back into it. Yeah, you got to think that they learned and heard the feedback uh, that you can't just keep stringing together cliffhanger after cliffhanger at the expense of time spent. Like you, if there's one thing I can say, and of course they're watching right now, when you establish the rules of your world, follow the rules of your world. And we will be all good. Yep. So uh, moving, uh, actually in keeping with HBO, uh, apparently HBO Max has reportedly greenlit another spinoff from James Gunn's suicide film, this time featuring Viola Davis, uh, which I can't say no to anything with her in it. Um, well, that's not true. The first Suicide Squad movie was pretty bad, despite her presence, but... The second film was amazing. The Peacemaker series was awesome. Um, I I have faith that this is going to be, if, if, if James Gunn is involved at all, it'll probably be good. Even if he's not, I think they're on the right track with these particular characters. Did you watch Peacemaker at all? I have not watched Peacemaker. Um, the only experience I have with Viola Davis, besides the first Suicide Squad, is the second Suicide, Suicide Squad movie. And the scene where Idris Elba comes in there and she's like blackmailing him you we're gonna need you and he charges her with the pen and puts it right to her throat she doesn't flinch at all and i want to learn more about that character <laughs> so i'm i'm into it <laughs> yeah yeah her character amanda waller um she's pretty ruthless in the comics as well hmm. um i know she's had a couple run-ins with like batman and some of the other big heroes so she's one of those scary government types you don't want to mess with. <laughs> yeah. Hey, take a great actor in a ruthless character. Sounds like a recipe of success for me. Yeah. So moving over to uh, the Disney side of things, this is something I know we're both <laughs> excited about because we're going to be doing an episode on it later in the year. Uh, the new Obi-Wan Kenobi trailer dropped this week. Um, it teased Darth Vader. We got to see a little bit more of the relationship between Obi-Wan and Uncle Owen yeah. and just a lot more of our, our general villains going this with the Inquisitors. Um, the more I see of this, the more excited I am getting. Hmm. Um, just because we talked about on the Boba Fett episode, 
They need to get off of Tatooine. And this trailer really drove that home that we are not going to be stuck on Tatooine for the entire duration. And that is great. We're going to be seeing a lot of interesting characters coming into this. Um, and some potential meeting between Obi-Wan and Vader could, mm -hmm. this could be a thing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, having the original actors back Ewan and Hayden is was already, I mean, everyone, every Star Wars fan was already going to watch this, but the trailer is, is good for, I wrote down the exact same thing you just said, Ben, we're not on Tatooine. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in places <laughs> we're clearly going to deal with inquisitors who we don't know their fate. So that gives some suspense to it because we obviously know Kenobi and Vader, um, you know, they, how, how their story ends. Um, that's actually how we started Star Wars back in 77. <laughs> so um, I think that's going to be cool. And I'm really interested to see the dynamics between Owen and Obi-Wan as Luke's guardians. Like we got a little piece of that. I'd like a lot more of that. Yeah, it should be fun. Cause uh, I remember back in 2002, you know, Joel Edgerton was cast as uncle Owen and no one knew who he was. Yeah. And in the years since, he's gone on to do some big films like Zero Dark Thirty. You know, he's gotten out there in the world. He's even directed some stuff. So now it's going to be interesting to go back into it and say, oh, yeah, this guy who now is like this critically acclaimed actor that we all love. That worked out well. That worked out well. <laughs> So uh, in keeping with Disney here for the news and actually moving into Marvel, production on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 has officially wrapped. And James Gunn has also teased that there is an unannounced actor mm. in the film. Mm. So, I mean, I'm hoping that they're able to uh, keep the lid on any big spoilers. Um, they Marvel did a Marvel and Sony did a pretty poor job keeping the lid on the Spider-Man spoilers. Yeah. Um, I would I would argue that they did a better job keeping the lid on Doctor Strange spoilers, but we won't get into that today. Um, but uh, I'm I'm excited. This is that this is supposedly the last outing for the original team up. Uh, we are definitely not going to see Dave Batista after this one. Hmm. Um, and uh, I would imagine that a few of his uh, companions will be joining him in retirement. Yeah. Well, I think it's. I'm just glad that it's happening or that it has happened, you know, because obviously there was a lot of question about it when James Gunn was released from Disney, but the fact that they're getting to do it and they do have kind of a rich plot, which is, this is not the Gamora of the first two movies. This is a Gamora who lived the other life. So we do have like some, some unknown tension, which is kind of rare for a third installment. So I'm, and I trust James Gunn, like we already said about Peacekeeper and Suicide Squad. I trust him implicitly. It's going to be fun. I um, mean, and, and also this is going to be, you know, six years later, we're finally going to meet Adam Warlock Yeah. after that tease in the credits. <laughs> I thought that was going to be the, a big part of like the Avengers Endgame and Infinity War. I know. I, I think, you know, a lot of us did because, you know, he I can't remember which which stone he was the bearer of in the comics. I think it might have been it was either the Mind Stone or the Soul Stone, but he was the bearer of one of the big stones in the comic book. So everyone thought, oh, cool, this is it. And it's like, eh, yeah. no. <sighs> but they they've been doing well enough with the movies. So, yeah, <laughs> no need no need to it follow worked. the comic books beat by beat. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> yep. And uh, finally, just going to do a quick box office update here. So we're recording on May 8th. To the surprise of no one, uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness has cleaned up at the box office this weekend, as of this recording, grossing an estimated $185 million at the domestic box office, mm -hmm. which puts it well ahead of the first film's opening weekend. Oh. And actually... You know, only about 20, 25 million shy of the original Avengers opening weekend. So oh. Doctor Strange has uh, really gotten a huge boost since he debuted. And I think Infinity War, Endgame and No Way Home definitely helped get his image out there and got, got people a lot more excited for this film. Yep. Um, everything else across the box office seems to be... Uh, where Doctor Strange won, a lot of a lot of other movies started to lose. Um, 
just about everything else that's you know still in the top 10 dropped at least 30 percent closer to 40 and 50 percent um but for a lot of movies that's not terrible um one of my favorites um everything everywhere all at once only dropped 40 percent still adding on you know, about three and a half million hmm. and has taken in a total of uh, about 41 and a half million over the course of its run, which for a tiny little film like that, that, you know, yeah. is some people probably think didn't, wasn't going to stand a chance is really good just to, to, be, to be able to hold on to roughly the number four or five spot for as many weeks as it has without dropping tremendously. is really good. Um, but I would expect Dr. Strange is probably going to clean up again next weekend. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to hold on to the number one at the box office until Top Gun comes out, because I know that's a huge sequel that uh, people are excited for. And especially considering that it has been delayed for yeah. so long due to the pandemic. So that that's my prediction. Do you think, do you think Dr. Strange will hold on at least that long? Yeah, I do. I mean, pretty much any marvel or superhero movie right now we're we're living in the in the comic book box office domination time like nothing surprises me anymore <laughs> i mean those numbers are already crazy and we're still kind of in a pandemic so it'll get even yeah. crazier <laughs> um and it should also be noted i forgot to mention this it dr strange did set uh the record for the, I believe it is the seventh best opening day of all time wow. in the United States, which again, for Dr. Strange, a character who, you know, just five and a half years ago when he originally debuted was kind of one of those iffy, like, is this going to work type of characters? Yeah. Didn't get, didn't get the love that the guardians got. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That first, that first movie, like, was kind of just one of them. It was also in the midst of Black Panther and Ragnarok and stuff too. So it was kind of C or D or E. Um, obviously you guys will talk about Dr. Strange a lot more, but he is kind of taking a mantle of, of leader, um, you know, in terms of what people expect in end game, it was kind of him and Tony making decisions, you know, with the one thing. So he has, he has gone to the A team. Yep. Moving on up. All right, that is the news for the week. So moving on to what we've been watching. Well, we can both safely say we've watched Doctor Strange, but again, we're not going to talk about it. That's not what we're doing. We're going to give the general audience a week to take it all in because not everyone makes it out on opening weekend. Yeah. Not everyone's as crazy as we are. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Doctor Strange, yep. Um, I, I mentioned everything everywhere all at once. I finally watched that since uh, since we last recorded. And as of this moment, I think it's my favorite movie of the year. Oh, it's quite good. Um, it. And I have uh, I have once again watched the Batman on HBO Max. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got it up to three. It's <laughs> I'm definitely it's definitely trying to weigh. Is it my new favorite? Or is the Dark Knight still holding that position? Because it's it's a tough one. They're both they're both really good. Yeah, Man, um, they they are like kind of generational differences. But obviously, you guys already talked about a lot of Batman. But I saw Batman in Hawaii, so it was very disorienting. <laughs> so I need to watch it on HBO again to 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 experience. I loved it though; it was great. Um, and finally, uh, the last sort of smaller thing I was been watching is a. Uh, got in a couple more episodes of our flag means death that has also been just a delightful show is that one you've heard about oh, miles what's that on uh it's on hbo max it is uh it's taika ytt and reese darby um sort of reuniting to tell reese darby is playing steed bonnet who is the real life gentleman pirate um who you know just he's this wealthy landowner who decides that he's bored with his life and it's just like he literally but you know builds a ship gets a crew together and decides he wants to go pirating and this is sort of you know a comic take on that he literally pays his crew a wage um and he's just like he's averse to violence so it's like what is he doing what is he trying to do out there and uh and taika is blackbeard oh. and just delightful in the role 
So I'll check that out. Any fans of Taika should definitely yeah. check that one out. Yeah, we just the second Ragnarok shout out. So yeah, let's let's do it. Um, <laughs> I've been I've been rewatching Stranger Things, <laughs> getting ready for season four. <laughs> I need to do that as well. It's been oh three gosh, years. has it three years since season three? And yeah, too long. It's it's too long to keep the hype up. So we've been rewatching it just to kind of even remind ourselves why the show is, is good. It's three years is too much of a gap. So it's been fun. I, I know it's, it's interesting that, uh, how, how hype levels vary between different projects. Like what, what is too long between TV, a TV, a season of television versus like, clearly the hype train is there for, for top gun. Mm-hmm. And that's been, mm. you know, decades. <laughs> yeah. That's but uh, I guess on the other hand, you kind of have to get the Stranger Things stuff done before all the kids age out of the roles. Yeah, that's that's my like biggest thing is the the collection of young talent on Stranger Things is the secret sauce. We got to get this out. You're exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, what they've got, I think they have what one more season after this. If they keep yep. you waiting too long, they're going to have to start to tell the story of graduating high school (laughs) either that or they're just going to have to uh bring in tom holland to play all the kids because he doesn't age he doesn't age yeah him and him and uh elijah uh elijah wood can do them all (laughs) yep all right so that's what we've been watching and now it is time to talk about moon knights the newest disney plus marvel series a sort of very unique series Mm-hmm. in what they attempted to do um so this is a spoiler cast so if you haven't watched moon knight yet this is the, p- the part where you leave go away <laughs> you know unless unless you don't care um but i'm going to start this off here i'm going to ask you miles how familiar were you with moon knight before you watched this series um really unfamiliar i i only knew moon knight as MCU's Batman base or, or not MCU as just the comics Marvel's version of Batman, a vengeful masked guy. I didn't know anything about the Egyptian or the, the personalities. So very little. I knew, um, I knew about the identity disorder. I mm-hmm. knew about the Egyptian gods. I'd read a few comics before going into this and knew just enough but Moon Knight is <laughs> even, I would say, on a lower tier of not necessarily just quality, but of just, of, I can't think of the word, but just awareness. Mm, the level of yeah. awareness that a general audiences would have had of Moon Knight before this would be less than Doctor Strange. Yeah. Um, probably yeah. on a similar level as the Guardians of the Galaxy before they made that film like a lot of people would say you know who's moon knight (laughs) um yeah i was i was just the same example this is like guardians level like obscurity i i had almost no idea (laughs) um so when they originally announced that moon knight was going to be a series almost three years ago which is insane um it was announced alongside Miss Marvel, She-Hulk, Armor Wars, uh, Secret Invasion. And for me, uh, when, once they dropped this, my hype level was through the roof because I thought, oh, cool. I never thought they would do this. Um, that is how obscure Moon Knight is. I literally thought this was never going to happen. And instead, it was like it became this big thing. And, and it was. It was like... Yeah, sure. Everyone was like, oh, She-Hulk. We know She-Hulk because, mm-hmm. you know, everyone knows Hulk. And like, oh, Miss Marvel. Okay, it's probably got a connection to Captain Marvel. Yeah. And then it was like, Ar- well, as soon as they announced that Armor Wars was going to be a war machine thing, it's like, well, yeah, of course, we're all in on that. Yeah. When, and did, they, doing- when did they tie Oscar Isaac into it? Was that from that from that beginning or... When did they, that's when, that's when I heard about it and really got pumped about it is when they. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Actually. I, 
I should have researched that because it wasn't when they originally announced it. It wasn't the picture of all the new shows. Okay. No, he... So I, it had to have been sometime in late 2020 or early 2021. Yeah. That's so, what peaked. That's what peaked my interest. Like as soon as Oscar Isaac was attached, I was like, okay, this is important. I just felt like that that's a level of a movie star that, you know, second only really maybe to Tom Hiddleston who had already been in the movie. So like to introduce that in the Disney plus shows, I was very intrigued. And this is also, of course, coming off of Oscar Isaac. Surprised, you know, I, to me, it was surprised that Oscar Isaac would do this because this is coming off of him just being absolutely frustrated with his experience doing Star Wars. Yeah. And you think, oh man, if he was frustrated doing Star Wars, why would he commit to doing Marvel? But uh, he took a really smart approach and said, I'm going to sign up to do this series mm -hmm. and nothing else. So. We'll talk about what that means for the future of Moon Knight later on, but uh, on, I honestly do think that that is, you know, considering his experience on Star Wars, a very smart move to not shoehorn yourself into something this big for years and years. Because um, yes. we, we know sometimes it works out really well if you're Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Evans, mm -hmm. or sometimes if you're Chris Hemsworth, it takes you a couple movies <laughs> Yeah. To, for you, for the character, for someone, for a director, director and writing team to come along and really get that character rolling. Because, uh, yeah, poor Hemsworth. I know signed. I think he signed on for a nine picture deal. You know, when he did the first movie, and he was ready to be done after Ultron. But yeah, we're all grateful that we are where we're at now with him. Yes, thank goodness. I think yeah, Robert Downey Jr. is the perfect example because he's he. I mean, he got paid in the middle there because he was like, yeah, I think I'm probably done. And then he got paid. So Oscar Isaac is gambling on himself. You know, it just kind of sounds like a football. You know, you take the one year deal to see if uh, uh, you can up your market value. And I think that the MCU, ne MCU needs Oscar Isaac now more than Oscar Isaac needs the MCU. So, uh, you know, I guess we're going to be talking about that, but this was smart. <laughs> So now that we sort of talked about the beginnings of Moon Knight, you know, the pre pre the show premiering, what are your thoughts on this series as a whole? Like, what are your favorite moments? What are your favorite casting? I mean, obviously Oscar Isaac, but, uh, mm. you know, were there other casting choices in it? What did you think about this show? Well, this was ambitious. Like, like I, you sounds like you knew a little bit more about the personality disorder and stuff like that. But when that first like came as I'm watching this show, I was like, wow, we are really diving into something heavy and deep. And for this to be part of a superhero show, um, I think that it was really cool. And I know we're going to go episode by episode. So I'll kind of chip in with moments as we do that. But the casting, not just Oscar Isaac, I loved um, Layla and of course, Ethan Hawke as Harrow. Um, I mean, this, this felt like the cast of a movie. It, I mean, it, they carried a lot of weight. They kind of carried the show, to be honest, the cast themselves. Oh, yeah. Um, Ethan Hawke is honestly not the actor I would have get. Not he's got he's got the skills, but I would not have guessed just due to the, the pedigree of the films he starred in. Like mm -hmm. he, he just seems at the outset like that kind of actor who would be too good for Marvel. But oh, yeah. He did a really, he did a great job. And he was also, he was actually very pro Marvel. He said, I don't know why there are actors out there who think that this is, or, or there are directors out there who think they're too good for this kind of stuff. He said, I enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, so, it, it does touch on our human emotion and huge themes that are respectable in any like artistic quote unquote, like the artistic, I mean, they are touching on some major themes. Um, I Harrow is like not really a part of the comics, right, Ben? He's he's not a big character. Um, from what I read, the character that they they made of him in the show is sort of an amalgamation of different mm. villains. I couldn't tell you which ones because again, I'm not that familiar with Moon Knight. Yeah. But that's well, you know that that's not that's not something that 
is foreign to Marvel either. They've done that with a lot of their villains across the films. I think that was a really good choice to put it in this actor with some gravitas. He's got the glass in his shoes. <laughs> he's He's got the, you know, proverbial point. You know, he, he's got his point of view. He's very committed. Um, he's he's an interesting character too. Harrow is because he's not really a hypocrite. He is willing to die because his scales are unbalanced. Um, you know, as we, as we see in the last episode. So when MCU first started the villain problem, there was always a villain problem. And I don't think we have that here. We have the two they've learned. You need, you need the hero, you need the villain. And because we have both Ethan Hawke and Oscar Isaac, that's, that's what keeps this show up. Um, and keeps it from collapsing on itself as such an ambitious thing. Yeah. Um, for me, um, what, what the thing that got me about this show was just the mystery. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I knew about the identity disorder, like just the way they told the story from the first episode was like, okay, I'm hooked. I'm hooked on this show in a way that I haven't been with a Marvel show since WandaVision when it presented such a unique way of telling a story. Um, I, I no offense to the other shows, but every other Marvel show has felt Marvel. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You can see the Marvel DNA in there. And then this one was something very different. And I loved that there was always, there was always a mystery to this show all the way until the final episode. There was always some kind of weird question to be, to be answered. Yeah, so are, it's a great way to keep dropped, you hooked. Yeah, we are dropped into, well, Stephen, Stephen's mind, and we know nothing at all, and we discover it with him. That was a, a great structure. I'm like, that was good. Yep, and I'll, I guess I'll talk about this one. Yeah, let's go to episode by episode now, because okay. <laughs> I think uh, I don't want to get into too many specifics with that last question, but uh, <laughs> so we'll just go. So for this, I'll do the title of the episode. I'll say who directed it. It's IMDb rating and the Rotten Tomatoes rating. Because I, I, I love I love looking at those numbers. I know yeah. I know a lot of people think, oh, Rotten Tomatoes, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, yeah, it's not a it's not a perfect metric. Neither is IMDb. Um, <laughs> no metric here is perfect. Right. So episode one, the goldfish problem, directed by Mohamed Diab. IMD rating 8.1, Rotten Tomatoes 91. Already off to a strong start. Yeah. You know, just, just like we were just talking about. Um, I love that they introduced Steven as yep. seemingly as the protagonist in the show. Because later on, it, it's a great twist to realize he was it was never about him the whole time. But yeah, we don't we don't have to play catch up. <laughs> In the first episode, like you were saying, that's different than the other Marvel, um, the other Marvel entries is that we are dropped into the very small, you know, this he thinks he's sleepwalking. Um, and we also meet Harrow with the fantastic first scene of the whole series, which is soundtracked by my man, Bob Dylan, <laughs> every grain of sand. I was hooked right from that moment. I mean, I was like, oh, we got Dylan here. We are, I'm rolling with this. Every grain of sand is one of his like early 80s songs, his, his, um, his born again phase, his Christian phase. But there is a lyric in there that I pulled out. In the fury of the moment, I can see the master's hand in every leaf it trembles in every grain of sand. I like, I can see why they picked this song. Yeah, there's, it's a good one. It's a great one to pick. And it's, mm. it's just so, it's so messed up that Harrow would pick this, this sort of would be Harrow's theme, sort of twisting this very beautiful song about a connection with God to mm -hmm. a man who's, whose connection with his God is, as we find out in, in the second episode, incredibly, incredibly twisted and, a, yeah. a little selfish. I want to say a little selfish. Oh, yeah. I think just um, he, he he misses the point, just like Captain America talks about from the first place. It matters how you do it. If you want to make a better world, it does matter how it's accomplished. And killing people 
<laughs> for their future is not not it. <laughs> yep. And so, yeah, we spent all of episode one just following Steven around mm -hmm. and we're as lost as he is. And we have, like, for me, like, the moment he wakes up in uh, Switzerland, I'm sure, I'm almost certain it's Switzerland, um, yeah. was like, oh, this is part of the, Mark has taken over. It's like, yeah. I got it right away, but, like, I cannot imagine what it was like for people going into that not knowing. It's like, wait, how? Yes. I was I was one of those because it's and then he he wakes up somewhere he's standing in a crowd all of a sudden yeah that was I color me intrigued you know how is he standing here now how, how did he get here all of that stuff was very interesting and obviously um, he's when he's driving and he comes back and he's killed a few of the henchmen you're you know you're concerned for what exactly are what exactly is the other Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation here. Yep. And then he just wakes right back up in his bed. And, mm -hmm. you know, some people out there are probably thinking, is it a dream? Yep. Is it all in his head? You know, until, uh, until Harold shows up at the museum. Mm -hmm. And then you get to see the scales. And I think that's a great moment, too, where he tries to read Stephen's scales. Yeah. It's like, I can't figure you out. There's chaos in you. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, we get to see his uh, his chase with the jackal into the restroom. And then we finally get to meet Mark properly mm -hmm. in what is just an absolutely baller scene with Isaac playing against himself. Incredible. Incredible throughout. <laughs> I, I definitely got some other scenes to shout out. Um. Well, I'll just say my piece then here really quick. And then, of course, we finally get to see the suit. Yep. And uh, it's it's one of my favorite looks of any Marvel hero. Like, it's just, it's it's scary. You know, it's not your typical, like, Stars and Stripes, Iron Man, like, I'm, you know, here to save you. Like, yep. Moon Knight is just... Moon Knight is there. Moon Knight's there to save you, but he's not. But he's also gonna. It's actually, you know, you you talked about the Batman. It's like Moon Knight mm -hmm. is kind of like that very first scene in the Batman, where it's like Batman saves the the guy from the thugs. Yeah. But the guy's like, "Don't hurt me." It's like that's that's what I imagine Moon Knight is like. Yep. It's like, yeah. Okay, he's a, nope. He's a tool of vengeance. He's a he's a. You know, the, even the way he kills that jackal just brutally down swinged on him. Yeah, he is. There's a little bit of fear with this superhero. Yeah. Um, you said you had a couple other big scenes from that episode. No, from the from future episodes. Oh. oh, future episodes. Well, let's move on to episode two then. Summon the suit, directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. IMDb 8.0, Rotten Tomatoes 91. So we're pretty much in the exact same ballpark here that we were with episode one. Um, and that's because the first episode, it leaves us with this cool image, but it also leaves us with that question of who is the man inside? We yeah. still don't know Mark yet. We're only seeing slivers of him in reflections. Like if, if you go back and rewatch, there are so many little reflection moments um throughout these first two episodes really kind of these two episodes are kind of paired together as are the next two um because we're in london yeah we we have really no idea what is like we get almost nothing in the first episode <laughs> the second episode is when steven begins his process of trying to figure out what could possibly be going on <laughs> and actually they're I forgot to mention scene episode one, but I think it pairs very well with episode two. Um, his first two encounters with Khonshu, mm -hmm. yeah, just in these narrow hallways. Like, is he really seeing this? Is this all in his head? It's really uh, Marvel's first attempt at trying to borrow from the horror genre. Um, it's never been like nothing scary like this. Yeah. That, yeah, that I the, can think of. 
Yeah, the the hallway scene, yeah, in episode one, and then the yeah the storage unit scene in episode two, which I guess is also a hallway. Yeah, I mean, Conchu is like purposely trying to scare Stephen into getting back, giving back the body to Mark. Yeah, the just the way the lights go, it's all so well lit, um, and it is definitely played for suspense, that horror type of suspense. Um, I I liked that. That's kind of the thing I heard about the show coming into it. I was like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna go for horror. Get ready, you know. This you've never seen this in the MCU. I think these two scenes are probably basically it. I guess we could talk about the undead Egyptians, but um, those two scenes are just laid out in the in such a suspenseful way. Like they're Contra's doing his uh, his magic show. And it's also worth noting too when he's in the storage unit. He sees all of the identities that Mark has. Hmm. So not only does Mark, you know, have dissociative identity disorder, he also just has the, all these other identities he just makes up because he's a mercenary, because he has to. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, it's become his life. Yeah. I mean, he is carrying some baggage, that's for sure. Um, the the scene where Stephen and Mark at the end of this, they've they've escaped, they've beaten the jackal for a second time. And they have their fight um, where Mark gets control of the body and traps Steven in the puddle. That, that is some Oscar Isaac like genius. I mean, he absolutely pulls off the two sides there and some of it is, is one shot. I mean, it's amazing. You forget, you forget that he's playing both these parts. Um, That, that episode five and episode six get most of the praise for Oscar Isaac's you know, ability to go between Stephen Grant and, and uh, Mark, but the end of season two, that first fight, that's, I think that's actually the more impressive one uh, rewatching it just for the performance itself from Oscar Isaac. (laughs) And that episode was, uh, I think the first episode to introduce a little bit of the fun side of the, the series when we got to meet Mr. Knight. Yes. And realized that with the different personalities, the Moon Knight persona takes on a completely different look and a completely different style of fighting. And that's just wonderful. Yeah. A more intellectual side, which kind of mirrors their, um, their identities itself. And that episode also introduced Layla into the show with its own bits of twisting, like poor Steven getting served divorce papers. (laughs) And it's like, wait, what? (laughs) Maybe the only divorce paper meet cute that has ever happened <laughs> because Stephen basically yeah. falls in love with Layla as she delivers him divorce papers and starts what is with the accent, you know, all that stuff. I thought that was really cool and set up a nice little triangle there between Stephen, Mark, and Layla. So then we're going to move on to uh, episode three, The Friendly Type, directed by Mohammed Diab. IMDb 7.7, Rotten Tomatoes 93. Uh, it seems to be tracking similar ground here on Rotten Tomatoes, but IMDb, it seems like uh, users were less into this, ep- you know, not by much, um, but this is probably the biggest dip the show will take mm-hmm. for audiences. And honestly, I agree. Um, it's not, a- after we sort of have resolved the mystery of, you know, Stephen and Mark are one and the same. Mm-hmm. Um, this episode just felt like it needed to insert plot device. Um, yeah, we need to f- we need to find the tomb, not the tomb, but uh, but the scrolls, and we introduce a character who is only in the one episode and is killed off very quickly. Yeah, not very interesting sort of sub villain. Um, but I do appreciate a lot of just the downtime we get in this episode before the big action stuff with Mm -hmm. that character, Um, the scene where Mark and Layla are on the boat together and we get to see, you know, there was this big hubbub about with uh, the, you know, the production crew, particularly with Mohammed Diab, you know, saying we want to present an Egypt. That's not, you know, what you think, you know, because there's this stereotypical view of Egypt that we as Westerners have that it's, you know, this third world country it's undeveloped you know it's just it's just a bunch of sand and pyramids and they really got to show off that 
this is a very this is a very modern culture. You know, yeah, I, I love that. I, I mean the the representation of Egypt not only in the actors but in just the way that they portrayed it, namely where the pyramids are. Like I think I think it's actually the end of episode two, beginning of this episode. Like the pyramids are surrounded by a city. Like every movie has the pyramids, like as some trek that you take out to the middle of the desert and you're a hundred miles from anything else where space aliens could have came and created the pyramids or something like that. You know, it's like, no, there's a whole culture and economy around these pyramids or at least uh, those, those specific ones. So um, that was really refreshing to see, to be honest. Yeah. This, does this episode have the, the meeting with the gods or is that episode four? They... Yes, this episode does okay. have the meaning with the gods. So that was, I think the use, user, the user bumped the score down a little bit. I think it has to do with that as well. Like the gods are kind of frustrating. Like they yeah. completely believe Harrow and dismiss Conchu. Like, couldn't they, like, why, why didn't Conchu just say he brought a bunch of, he brought like 40 excavators down to the country of Egypt? Like, what do you think he's doing? <laughs> Like it was just kind of the gods were so dismissive. So, I mean, I guess they have to be right. Um, playing devil's advocate to myself. You can't have engaged and watchful gods. <laughs> otherwise, <Yeah. laughs> otherwise you don't have very good storytelling tension, but um, that was kind of disappointing that all that whole scene. Yeah. I think, I think it, that scene ended up like becoming a meme where it literally is just like, here's all my evidence. And then Harrow just says, Nope. And they're like, okay. We believe you. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, to the point um, where I think a lot of people thought the gods must be in on this. Like the gods must be evil because they did it so much um, or they favored Harrow so much. Um, yeah, so that that was kind of a, a stumble there. Yep, thankfully, we have episode four, mm-hmm. The Tomb, directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. Uh, IMDb 8.3, Rotten Tomatoes 93. So we're jumping back up here with the audience into the about average. Um, and I had heard um, just on Twitter before this episode aired, you know, insiders saying, this is the one. This is the one where stuff's going to start happening. You know, you got to watch this one all the way to the end. And, uh, you know, there's some great stuff that happens at the beginning and the middle of the episode. Um the horror stuff, the horror elements are brought back. I think actually even worse in this one because they don't show it, but just that scene where that, you know, that weird decayed, you know, possibly mummy type creature is cutting into the body and you can hear it. Yeah. And Layla is just right there and has to just crawl around on the floor. The sounds they make, the click, click, click. I call, I wrote them down as the undead Egyptian priests. I don't know exactly what they are, but yeah, there you're right. The horror definitely comes back there, especially with Layla, both hiding as it like eats that guy or whatever, and and when she's running along the cliff there too. Yeah. Uh, this episode actually gave me really wonderful flashbacks of uh, the 1999 Mummy. Mm-hmm. I was like, yep, that's that is a good good star to shoot for because that is you know to this day sort of the the best modern interpretation of you know egyptian horror on film that i can think of um, oh yeah so then that's right in our in our wheelhouse as far as the age that we were when that came out as well yeah. i'm sure people older than us were definitely talking indiana jones during this episode um the Mummy is actually my wife's favorite movie, and she will be joining us for our Stranger Things <laughs> episode. So, shout out to that coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just um, Layla definitely reminded me a lot of Evelyn from The Mummy. Um, yeah. Stephen, not so much. Um, Rick, um, Rick's yeah. definitely more the the dashing hero type. But uh, you know, it was it was still cool to see and uh, and to see. Uh, you know, I don't think I don't think they really went far enough with this twist, but it was a cool twist that they were in the tomb of Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. I think they could have done a little bit more with that. Just yeah, that's really cool. Up, you know, I, yeah, I would like to see a lot more of that. What 
how exactly that worked. As a, yeah, this one thing this series could have done if they, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. If, if they'd had more of a budget, man, it would have been so cool to see flashbacks of mm -hmm. former avatars and seeing the gods really like, what were they like, you know, back in the ancient times and how they came up with the concept of this. Yeah, I, I think budget is the right word of why we didn't get that and why we didn't get a few things in this. I think they chose the right things to focus on, but, you know, that's more meat on the bone to to um, to explore. So, yeah, before we get to the twist, which, of course, is the <laughs> this really I was so impressed with Layla in this episode, just her, the the actress and I. I should have wrote her name down. Uh, I think it's uh, May Callumaway. May May Callumaway. I'm really excited to see her going forward. She was so expressive and so like defiant in the face of like the the classic villain speech from Harrow and the the classic you know hero trying to protect her. She just had like just this energy about her throughout the throughout the hiding throughout the defeating the Egyptian thing that captures her on the on the edge of the cliff there i loved her acting and i i wanted more I, I still want more of layla here this this episode was kind of layla's episode before it became the episode where we port over to an asylum <laughs> but i mean even just in the very beginning she got honestly it's not a huge action scene but she proved that she can almost outsmart mark mm -hmm. like in the scene where she takes the flare and hides oh, yeah. it behind the jeep I was like, yep, she's, you know, if I don't think Moon Knight's going to get as much exposure as the movies just because it's on Disney Plus and, you know, it doesn't get the same publicity. If Moon Knight had been a movie and it had gotten this big push, this big publicity push and was a big Marvel film, I, I honestly think that Layla would be joining um, Peggy mm -hmm. um, as one of those top tier like Marvel women and yes. and uh, and Captain Marvel like oh. Should I be think, up there. I think we're gonna get there. I think this she's got it in her. I hope so. Me too. Um, <laughs> but uh, the tomb. There's not just tombs in that episode. There's a huge twist. Yeah. Wow. When, when all of a sudden Mark Spector is killed, and uh, obviously, you know, we're thinking, oh, he's not really dead, right? It's only the fourth episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden. <laughs> we are in an asylum and it sort of tries to explain, tried to explain everything that Mark has gone through in real world concepts. Like, Oh, he's got a moon Knight action figure. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Stephen Grant character is, you know, an old school serial movie type of hero. And it leaves you thinking, and, and then Mark and Stephen meet up. And of course we have the encounter with, uh can't remember the name of the god but the hippopotamus <laughs> and it literally is that that moment of like wait we have to stop now <laughs> that was the most frustrating ending yeah i would the, and the whole time we're like okay we've got we we've shifted into mummy mode we've shifted into indiana jones mode this series is really catching on and then it's like just kidding and we just hard bank at the end of this episode over to the asylum I couldn't agree more. Like th this was truly one of the moments that I like sat up in my seat and I literally, I'm sure I said, what, <laughs> what are we doing? You know, it's, and it ends with the hippo and the cheerful hi, hi. <laughs> it's not even like a hello, you know, <laughs> it's like, and that's where it ends. Unbelievable twist. And I'm glad we had a week to, talk about that um you know i not to go back to like netflix and stranger things and stuff like that but one of the things that makes that so much better is the week in between um and this <laughs> between episode four and five was the time for that for sure what happened <laughs> yeah all the speculation just is this in his head is this mm -hmm. reality if this is reality like what plane of existence are we on yeah this is happening. 
it was yeah so weird and it just makes you question like everything that came before mm -hmm. but like you said we only had a week to wait before episode yep. five yep. asylum directed by mohammed diab imdb 9.0 rotten tomatoes 94 easily the highest rated episode on imdb mm. And uh, I believe it's also the highest rated on Rotten. It's tied with episode two for the highest rated on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, boy, oh boy, like we've already gotten a lot of great character work out of Oscar Isaac just trying to unravel two different characters at the same time. Mm -hmm. This was the one that he really got the opportunity to go all out with Stephen and Mark and yeah. they just and there are moments too where they pulled like you know th those wonderful parent trap type of moments where it's like you literally finally got to see them a lot on screen together um, yeah. and it was just just great to see that but also just honestly some of the most heart wrenching moments in all of the MCU yeah this this was brutal. Disney Plus did not shy away from what happened. You know, like, I think I was most worried about, you know, I know we're going to talk about like, you know, the, the DID and the disassociative uh, personality, you know, identity disorder, but to discover it in this way, the brother's death, Stephen slowly discovering the truth of, you know, the reality of his mother's hate and, and cruelty towards him. And then the creation of Steven, like all of that was such, such important work. I think we all had to see that. And we all had to, um, we all will carry what, what we felt in that episode. Like you talk about heartbreaking. My wife was just sobbing the whole time. Um, we will carry that with us in future installments if Moon Knight, when and if Moon Knight comes back, we will carry that like connection with with those two characters now, Stephen and Mark. But I I don't think I can even watch it again, to be honest. I, I agree with the 94%, but I just can't see myself like turning this back on like I watch Infinity War and Endgame all the time. Like it it is truly heart-wrenching, like you said. Um yeah, Moon Knight explores trauma in a way that mm -hmm. I don't think I can't think of another MCU film or I mean WandaVision's the closest yeah. easily. The only other yeah. property that's really explored trauma. Mm -hmm. Um I suppose Loki has in its own way. I think <laughs> now I think about it, yeah, I think the show the TV because you get so much time with these characters, do a little bit more yeah um but this one i think is just at least for for me and clearly for you the most heart-wrenching that we've seen Yeah, and we we see iron man dip into you know ptsd um a bit uh especially in iron man 3 i think i mean did is a lot more complex than you can get in a disney plus show or that you could you could read every book in the world and you can't understand the human brain, right? It's a, it's a spectrum disorder. You know, it's not something that you should just like Google and find out that you've learned it, you know, because it is something that is um, very hard to, to end. But I think you sent that article to me, you know, about like how, you know, this was as realistic as it could be, you know, as far as portraying what that is like. Um, I was really worried that it was going to go back and it was going to be some cookie cutter traumatic moment, you know, like just the brother dying or something like that, as if that is the type of trauma, you know, the real trauma is the relationship with the mom after that. And I think that's a lot more realistic to what, what can create this, not just a cookie cutter moment where one bad thing happens in the past and everything else is perfectly normal. And you start talking to yourself. Like this was some serious systematic trauma that happened to this character. And that makes sense why they would then develop this, these personalities. Just hard to even talk about. I, I feel like heartbroken for Mark. It's so wow. tough. <laughs> 
And then it, 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 on top of that, it ends with this tragic realization that in order for Mark's scales to balance with his heart, he has to let go of Stephen. Mm-hmm. And he's not ready to do it. The audience isn't ready to do it. Mm-hmm. And it was genuinely this, this fear that is this the end for Stephen? Are we literally only going forward with Mark now? And with this mysterious third personality that they've teased a couple of times mm-hmm. across the series. And is that third personality finally going to come forth in episode six? Yeah. I think another good reason or another payoff as to the decision to introduce the character with Steven is our connection to when he goes over the boat and into the sand. I mean, that that's a lot different. Uh, that hits a lot different if we meet Mark first, you know, so I think that was a nice storytelling yeah. order. And then to have Mark end up in the field of reeds, which is also just tragic because, and I think it's episode one, Stephen describes the field of reeds to the little girl in the museum. Mm-hmm. And she says, you know, why aren't you, are you going to go to the field of reeds? He's like, well, I'm not dead. Yeah. So yeah. Stephen doesn't get to Stephen's go there. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark, you know, we'll jump into episode six here, gods and monsters directed by Justin Benson, Mohammed Diab and Aaron Moorhead. So all three of them getting together for one big climactic moment. IMDb 8.1 rotten tomatoes, 84, the lowest rated on rotten tomatoes and getting to the lower end of the spectrum here for IMDb. Um, yeah. Episode six. Um, there's a lot to unpack with this one. <laughs> yeah. I saw you. I saw you post that you just weren't sure about your your thoughts on it. Um, yeah, and that is, I I I like what they have. I was really happy that Stephen gets to come back and be part of the story. He can't just abandon him. Um, I'm a sucker for giant monster fights, so you know, I'm also. I also, and this is a completely different topic, like I'm also just super forgiving of like these types of big budget things that like, oh, the CG is never perfect. It's like, yeah, so what? Go back to the 80s. The stop motion effects are never perfect. You know, go back to the 50s. You know, every special effects driven thing. Like there, you're going you're gonna to have these moments in time that mad, where magically everything does seem to work like Lord of the Rings. You look at that and it's like, how does that still look as good as it does? Yeah. Well, it's because they sunk just about every penny they could into it Uh because if they didn't, then it, you know, the expectations for that were just higher than anything in the world. The expectations for moon Knight aren't the same. It doesn't have to be perfect. And frankly, I don't think any special effects movie has to be perfect. You just have to be invested enough in the world to be along for the ride. So I appreciated the giant monster fight. Um, I liked the fight with her. I loved introducing Scarlet Scarab yes. um, with Layla. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, my yeah, my we, only, and oh. we can jump straight into the, what do we think of how it ended? Because I think that goes very well along with this because I liked everything. But for me, the problem with this episode is they, They uh, bind Amit to Harrow. And then you get to go back into, you know, into Mark's brain and see how he defeats Harrow in his mind. And it just ends. Yeah. Um, It's it's like, um, it would be like if Iron Man had ended right after Tony uh, beats um, Ironmonger. Yeah. And they don't have Mm. the press conference. They don't have the I am Iron Man moment. They don't have Coulson saying we're called S.H.I.E.L.D. You know, like it just, I find man, it just ended like, where's the cool down moment? Like, yeah, that's, and you know, people complain about the Marvel formula about how, oh, they just make the same movies. Like this isn't a complaint about the Marvel formula. This is just storytelling. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a thing that you have to have in all storytelling. It's like to move away from Marvel and actually jump right back into Lord of the Rings. If Return of the King had just ended right as they threw the ring into Mount Doom, mm-hmm. like, Sure, you know you you you've accomplished your main goal, but 
it's, you know, we want to see, like, we want to see Frodo journeying back home. We want to see the reunion with everybody. We want to see Aragorn, you know, his coronation. You know, that's all important stuff, too. And that just wasn't there with Moon Knight. Yeah, I think Lord of the Rings is a perfect example. So is Iron Man. I mean, it's it's kind of the competing expectations of what a Disney plus Marvel finale is even supposed to do, which I think from their perspective, they don't, they don't actually even want to give you that. They, they want you to, you know, their goal was to introduce Moon Knight, not to create Lord of the Rings, you know, just like WandaVision's goal was to supplement and explain some backstory before, you know, Dr. Strange. Like, I think that, expectations of what the disney plus shows should be you know um i feel like the penultimate episode is like every one of them is like that's what we wanted to get out of this and the final episode is like here's a half-hearted bow around it just just to kind of say that it ended because this one my my wife literally said the words that's it question mark (laughs) right when it went to credits on moon night um you know we were just like wait what that that's where it ends um i didn't mind the episode necessarily i also don't mind the cg like ben like you you know go back and watch anything and you do have issues the key and i'm just stealing your words again but is the investment so i totally agree with you on that i didn't have any problems with that um I think just the way it ended and the fact that if Oscar Isaac doesn't return, then I may not remember this series that well. If he does return and we get more Moon Knight and he becomes a central figure, then this series is the weight that we carry every time we see that character. So we're kind of, we're kind of up in the air about what Moon Knight is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then of course, got to talk about that you know mid credit stinger because Mm -hmm. while we didn't get the closure that we usually get with this kind of storytelling we got a tease of like you know what it this this tease that we've been getting throughout the entire series finally comes to light and at that point we're like okay we need more of this too Mm -hmm. you know they finally introduced jake lockley and like what a just from you know the 30 seconds we get to see oscar isaac portray of him it's like what a completely different personality again. <laughs> I love it. I know. I want to see a lot more of Jake Lockley. I feel like for budgetary reasons, we didn't see him get them out of a jam in this episode. Like, remember, they're they're in the street and um, Mark and Steven both black out and they wake up and they have defeated Harrow. Um, that was something in episode one and two. It was a storytelling device. In episode six, you can kind of feel cheated. Um, I think yep. budgetary stuff is the real reason for that. And I'm okay with that, but yeah, Jake Lockley, that mid credit stinger. Um, I very much want to see, I love how he's got the, like he, he's speaking Spanish, right? I believe. Yeah. So yeah. Like let's get Oscar Isaac doing all three of these guys. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for the moon Knight movie. Like, I don't think we need another Disney Plus show. Get the movie up. So let's see. Um, we've broken down every episode now. Yep. So I'm going to ask you, which one is your favorite episode and why? I think episode four was my favorite. For all of the Layla stuff with the Egyptian undead and for the twist, which just got me thinking, you know, just about what this really is and questioning the reality of what I had seen in a meaningful way. So I think episode four. I chose episode five um, Mm. for, you know, pretty much every, the reason that everyone's saying it's, you know, it's the best character study for, for Mark and Steven really got down to the core of who they are. Um, But I also put, you know, episode four is as an alternate, because for me, really diving into the horror genre in the way that Marvel hadn't yet mm-hmm. in a way that we get to see a little bit more of in Dr. Strange. And I'm excited for, for that to talk about that next week. Um, I'm just, I'm excited to see Marvel branch out into genres that it has yet to explore really. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of my, one of my friends has, 
made a really good observation. It's like, you can't always just look at these movies as comic book movies. Um, some of them are much more obvious than others. Like uh, The Winter Soldier is a political thriller that just happens to have superheroes in it. Mm. Um, I think that's, you know, um, that's the secret sauce of the MCU going forward because you can't keep this up for 30 years. You know, you've got to be able to do that to yep. go into the different genres. So I just lost my place. Ah, so let's talk a little bit about expectations for the characters. So what were your expectations for sort for how each of Mark's personalities and Moon Knight himself were portrayed and were they met? They were definitely met. I, I'm lucky that I didn't have much expectation for this. Maybe that's why I can enjoy the MCU so much more than Star Wars sometimes, <laughs> even though I'm such a Star Wars obsessive. I I mean, I was just along for the ride. And I mean, Oscar Isaac blew me away. His performance, I don't know if he's eligible for an Emmy, if it's a limited series or if it's a season or whatever, but I mean, he's got my vote. Like that's, <laughs> that's how good it was to me. I think that, uh, yeah, for me, there's a, there is this sort of notion that you've talked about a little bit that like Moon Knight is sort of viewed as Marvel's Batman. Mm -hmm. And that really isn't the case in this show. And actually in the comic books, I believe it's Steven is actually supposed to be this like billionaire playboy. Oh, And they decided we don't want to do that because, you know, Bruce Wayne has kind of really got that covered um we don't and you know especially considering that just a few weeks prior to the premiere a new batman movie had <laughs> just been released to theaters so i think i think it's smart for them to also try to make moon knight as unique a character as they possibly can but i will admit yeah visually it's like moon knight is you know is about as close to batman as marvel can get yeah you know, a character that um, and, and like Batman is a character that at, fights crime almost exclusively at night. Mm -hmm. um, but I do love that this this series took a more, you know, adventure Indiana Jones mummy type of vibe to it. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm not too big into the Moon Knight comics, so I didn't have that many expectations. So. I really did not have a problem with how they portrayed Mark, Steven and Moon Knight. Um, I just, I just hope we get more. Yes. <laughs> um, my gosh. Um, you've already kind of gone into this, this quite next question, which what was your mindset at the end of episode four? Like, mm. you know, a lot of people were starting to think that the story was like, Oh, was it, was it an all in Mark's head the whole time? Or like, what could it possibly be? And, um, my thought was definitely it can't all be in Mark's head because enough of the story has been told from um, Layla's viewpoint that unless, unless it turned out that Layla was another one of his personalities, yeah. well, we, then there was we no saw, way they could have done that. Yeah. And we saw Layla in the asylum, a brief moment of her there. Yeah. But I, and there were also just those scenes too, where like, where Harrow would meet with the gods by himself. You know, there were scenes without Mark. And it's like, so it can't all be in Mark's head, can it? <laughs> um, no. Yeah, I think my mindset going in or going after was like, we're going to dive into Mark's brain or in Stephen's brain more so than it wasn't real. Like I, I also didn't feel that what we had experienced could have been, could have been like all fiction, all a dream. Um, yeah, so that that was my. I was thinking we're about to go see what's really going. On. Like this is just a visual representation of his brain um, as he dies, right? Because <laughs> what triggers that is him being shot. So um, yeah, that was my mindset. And that's something too that I don't think has been explored too much in Marvel. Literally going inside the mind. I think the closest we get is at the end of Infinity War, where. Thanos uh, go, sort of goes inside the Mind Stone and sees 
you know, young Gamora. Yeah. Hmm. Um, is probably the closest we get to sort of seeing the interior of a character's mind. Oh, geez. I, you know, I completely forgot about this too. It's also worth noting that, uh, infinity war. So the best of my recollection is the only other story in the MCU where like moon Knight, it just ends. Mm. But there's a purpose to that. You know, we knew that there was going to be another movie coming and they, they really just wanted us at the end of that to be on the edge of our seats, ready for the next movie. Yeah. We always knew that was really part one. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, with Moon Knight, we're just, we're still up in the air. Like, is there going to be another one? <laughs> Please. Please. Uh, actually, speaking of Thanos, let's, let's talk a bit about, about Arthur Harrow. How is, how is his philosophy similar to Thanos and how is it different? Because there's some parallels to be drawn there. Yeah, I think, well, I think ultimately the thing that I already said, which is they are trying to make a better world or a better galaxy through means that they think is right, not seeing that the means by which you make the world better or the galaxy better is just as important as the end result. Um, so I, I think that Harrow and, you know, Ahmed's philosophy there doesn't allow redemption. You know, it, it takes away free will and that is wrong. Even if in the grand calculus, maybe that works for them, you know? So I think that's very similar to Thanos's idea uh, of removing half of life in the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the only difference I see in their approach is simply that Thanos, uh, Thanos's approach is a scientific approach. He sees mm -hmm. the numbers. He mm -hmm. says, if life keeps growing exponentially, then the numbers will, you know, our natural resources won't be able to sustain the numbers. Whereas with Harrow and Ahmed, it's like, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of we need to wipe out all that is evil in the world. Yeah. You know, and yeah, keep the good. Yeah. Faith and science. Yeah. There is a difference there. Do you think that Thanos included himself in the snap? Like he had a 50, 50 chance of evaporating. That's a good question. I don't know. Because Harrow, Harrow would have, he would have, I mean, yeah. he was willing to walk the walk. So it'd be interesting to know like exactly where that parallel is. Yeah, because like, can the infinity, because I'm going to say no, because he then later uses the infinity gauntlet to destroy the stones. Mm. Like he doesn't, oh, yeah. he doesn't ever consider that, you know, like he wants to, he wants to see what he's done and be part of it. Yes. You see, yeah, he doesn't necessarily, Thanos doesn't necessarily abide by his own grand rule, whereas Harrow accepts his judgment. Ahmed, you know, I know my skills aren't balanced. Kill me now. That's, I've always known that's coming. That's why I walk around with glass in my shoes. Um, yeah, so there's a difference there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, th I think, uh, I think that is, again, part of what makes Arthur Harrow an intriguing villain is because, you know, it's, I don't think it's necessarily the worst idea to like to rid the world of evil, but like, you know, even if your scales balance more towards evil, it's like, it's the Darth Vader question. Like mm -hmm. where's, where's your, where's your wiggle room for redemption? Yes. If, yes. if, if Obi-Wan had killed Darth Vader in a new hope, well, the emperor may win. Yep. Exactly. You have to leave room for to make the right choice in the end. You know, the the best time to start doing right is right now. And Darth Vader does that. And and Jamie Lannister does it in Game of Thrones. And Billy from Stranger Things does it. Um, you know, they they miss that part, Harrow and Ahmed. So was it refreshing to see a show? set in the MCU that doesn't require any knowledge of previous films or, or shows to enjoy. And is that something you'd want to see with other characters going forward? Mm. I do think it was refreshing to not be connected. I mean, that was kind of the secret sauce of 
the Infinity Saga, we had like a 12 origin story movies connect in a universal plot line. But at first, they were all separate. So it was kind of nice to go there. I don't necessarily need it, though. Like, I don't think that I have to have it going forward. Like the isolation of... I'm I'm more worried about connection for connection's sake. Like, just, you know, look at this guy's also here. Like, we got to remember, we got still got to tell the story and we still got to be true to what makes sense. But um, I don't know. I'm kind of down with either. I know it's kind of a non-answer. But what about you, Ben? <laughs> um, I, I too, I, I, I felt this was refreshing. Um, it was nice to catch the handful of Easter eggs that they dropped that you, you know, you don't have to have seen. But like when they when they mentioned the ancestral plane from Black Panther, it was like, oh, that's that's a nice touch, you know. Since we're already talking about the afterlife in this show, um, why not? Um, but yeah, it's. It, I'm glad that it's not beholden to everything, and I'm glad that it's not, like you said, they're not just throwing in a cameo for the sake of like, ooh, look at that, yeah. because, you know, there's, I I think that that's something I am going to be a little bit worried about with a lot of MCU content going forward mm -hmm. since Spider-Man No Way Home established this precedent yeah. of, oh my gosh, look what we can do. Yes. You know, look for all these corners of the world we can pull from. Yeah. Um, yeah and that, uh, yeah. That wears <laughs> off, but the timelessness of the story is what you need to be focusing on. So I share, I share that like concern. Um, yeah, and it's it's worth noting that uh, this series nearly did feature a cameo from some of the Eternals in a flashback sequence set in ancient Egypt, and that was deemed too expensive. Mm. Uh, from what I from what I've read, um, they wanted to bring in particularly they wanted to bring in Kamel Nanjiani um, to do Kingo again, yeah. which would I I love him. He's he's a hoot. Um, mm -hmm. it, I think it would have been a fun cameo, but you know I don't think this series needed that connection yeah i agree i mean it would have been cool but meeting meeting mark steven layla that was the that was the goal i think and honestly um coming out of this series i would actually think that uh that layla is the more likely character to volunteer to join the avengers mm. than then well, obviously we don't know about Jake yet, but like no. then Mark or Steven. Yeah, that's a good point. Like Moon Knight, you know, Mark slash Steven slash Jake, like how exactly they fit into a team. I think Layla's Layla fits in great. I would love to see her helping out on various things. Her and her and Falcon or her and Captain America uh, being aerial support. Cause she, I don't know. She can, she, she can fly with those wings. Right. I saw some blocking yeah. bullets, but yeah. So I think that, um, I think that's in our future. <laughs> so we've kind of, I mean, we've talked about this throughout the entire episode, but what did you think of how the show presented um, on dissociative identity disorder? And, you know, I sent you that link and it's like, I thought that was really interesting that, you know, psychologists actually said, yeah, this is actually, as accurate as you can get, given you're telling a fictional story with weird superheroes. Mm -hmm. I'm just so glad that they didn't water it down, that they showed the amount of trauma over time that it takes to do things and didn't just write it off as one thing that happened in a life. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I talked about it a lot. What, what did you think, Ben? Did you, you know, you sent me that article, but was it a, I, it, it actually made me think about um, the early 2000s horror film Identity mm. with John Cusack and, oh gosh, I can't remember who else is in it. Um, but that, you know, I'm, I'm totally about to give away the, the spoiler for that movie for those of you. Have you seen Identity? I have not, but you can go ahead and spoil it. <laughs> it's my fault for not so, seeing it for 17 years. <laughs> so uh, it's about a bunch of strangers who end up you know, by happenstance at a motel during this big storm and, you know, they all start dying off. And, you know, the, the whole mystery is who's the killer. And meanwhile, you have this secondary storyline of this 
guy, this known murderer is, uh, he's on trial and his, his, his psychologist is trying to convince the jury that he, you know, just has multiple personalities. Well, and the twist is everything that ha that's happening in the hotel are all of his personalities inside his head. And they're all starting to kill each other off. And the twist is which of those personalities is the killer. And then in the end, of course, the killer is the one who survives. Nice. And so the, you know, the actual killer ends up escaping and it's like, but that does feel like the watered down version of it mm -hmm. is this person has a problem and now we're going to put him through this intensive, you know, trial of trying to root out what the person, which personality is evil. Mm -hmm. And it's just going back and forth. And it's like, and knowing that, you know, there really are those sort of moments of amnesia of like, wait, where am I now? Like, yes. It's it's yeah, obvious that they did a lot more research for this than what I've been used to seeing in the past in film. Yeah, the article that you sent talked a lot about the amnesia as being one of the main like things that are missing from other portrayals or other, you know, characterizations is that you really do like you were gone for an amount of time <laughs> and that needs to be reconciled when you were then your other identities. Um yeah, so it it's not a comfortable thing to experience, certainly, as, as no disorder should be. But yeah. I thought, like you said at the beginning, as far as a Disney Plus show, it did as good of a job as it could have done. And obviously, you know, <laughs> they get to sort of blur those lines as they get further along in the story. But again, mm -hmm. it's a superhero show with weird characters. So by the end, it's like, it's suddenly okay that they're inhabiting the same brain and can just jump back and forth. Yep. And Mark, they're having Mark, that reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. Mark says like, you are my superpower to Steven, right? Like, so they, they're kind of setting that up for that to kind of be, you know, his, his advantage, which I think, you know, the brains and the brawn and the other brawn <laughs> when we get to J clock. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about another another interesting element of Mark's per, of Mark's character, and that uh, they do they do show in the show that Mark is Jewish. Mm. Um, now, do you think the show properly sort of reconciles his faith with his duty to Konshu and the necessity of violence in in that role, or um, could the show have maybe taken a cue from what I think is? I'll just flat out say it. I think it's a much better representation of the conflict of faith and violence in Daredevil. Mm. Yeah. Daredevil definitely does a better job because it's one of the main themes. I don't think this show really tackles that at all. I mean, it's kind of one of the things that gets pushed off to the side. Um, the, the astral plane line from the hippo is probably kind of the saving grace. Or like it's saying, Hey, like, there's no right or wrong, you know, spirituality. They're all connected up there. You know, the hippo is with the field of reeds and, you know, all this stuff can be, can be true at one time. So I think they kind of address it there, but they've punted it. This is, they haven't addressed this yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I know uh, I, I did look up like how it, how it affects him in the comics and actually one of the reasons he develops an identity disorder in the comics is that um, a rabbi that he had trusted, he learns was actually a Nazi deserter. Oh. And that really just makes him really question his faith. Mm. And I think, I think that's important when, when you make, when you make a character's faith, you know, when you make it an important part of the character, I think it could be better addressed. And, that's again, that's a potential season two thing. And I also understand that we are far enough removed from world war two, that that particular storyline may not fit, mm. but there's always, there's always something going on in the world for those who, who adhere to a faith just to make them say, wait, Hmm. Yeah. There, there was definitely a lot of stuff to address involving being jewish obviously this is heavily set in the middle east 
in general. I know Egypt is in, you know, North Africa too. I mean, they're all right there. So not pretending to, to be an expert on it, but it seems like that's a, a central thing to be tackled. <laughs> Again, just not another thing that you can dive even further into in season yeah. two. <laughs> and MC, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done a good job of this. Take the thing that is, you know, the most potentially controversial by ignoring and make it the plot of your show. Falcon and the Winter Soldier made racism in America as like the central theme of their show and take that and talk about it. And I, I think I trust them to do this. So it should be interesting. Um, I'm actually going to skip over the next question because we have already really dove yeah. into the conflict between choice and fate between Khonshu and Amit. Um, this, this one I just plugged in cause it's, it's the same, it's the same question that pops up. And like, every time a Marvel movie pops up, like, you know, uh, like I think Thor the Dark World is one of the best examples. Like they're in, they're in freaking London in Thor the Dark World. Why aren't other Avengers showing up when a giant spaceship lands in London? Um, like it's just, you know, and I, I, you know, I know they can't be everywhere, but it's like, man, where was Khonshu when literally, I literally wrote, you know, bracket, insert any Marvel villain here was bracket, insert any evil plan here. Like, Man, like I feel like Arthur Harrow, you know, in his days should have been wiping out Obadiah Stane, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Loki, <laughs> um, yep. you know, like all these all these villains. Like, where where were you? And it's like, and I get it. Like, yeah, I mean, it is a good question. And like the Eternals, you know, they were explained by opting out again, you know like it was tough to opt out but they did it and the egyptian gods i guess my like head canon about that as of now is that Khonshu doesn't really do a good job of good and bad and when Khonshu sees things that are maybe happening maybe he dispassionately thinks i'm gonna find a way to use thanos's plan for my own selfish needs <laughs> you know like he instead of facing San thanos he's like okay that guy's doing that and I'll try to clean up, you know, like, I don't know that Khonshu really has a very good sense of right and wrong, as we see from, from Jake Lockley. So I think Khonshu might actually side or justify why he is necessarily not opposed to these bad threats. But I guess we'll see. Yeah. I'm going to skip over the question about music as well, because we really dove into okay. yeah. Bob Dylan. And... Uh, the Engelbert Humperdinck song, of course, I think is also, Ooh. yeah, we can talk about that for a sec because we didn't really talk. I love that song. Um, yes. A Man Without Love. Um, <laughs> That's a sixth you know, episode. That, that is a perfect choice as well. I love that. Um, they did a good job with the music and presumably spent some of the budget on those two songs. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's perfect because it's literally, you know, the first thing you hear as Stephen is waking up and at first you you know in the, after those first few episodes you think oh this is about you know Steve, this is a song about Stephen about a lovesick man mm -hmm. you know who just is down on his luck and I, I'll say this though even though Stephen even though Stephen is kind of a dork one of the most unrealistic things about the show is that Oscar Isaac is not seen as an attractive human being <laughs> yeah, I know he's like because yeah. wow yeah the the museum lady is like i'm not into that guy like no way i mean it's oscar isaac for crying out loud yep. <laughs> um but it really that song really also is great as a great metaphor for what mark is going through because he's a man who was without maternal love for his entire life mm. and that really screwed him up yeah he wakes up and he breaks up in a completely different way from steven wow yeah, that's good. And kind of makes me wonder if there's a if there's a story for Jake in there as well. Yeah, I've, that is. I mean, we talk most of this episode, Ben. We've been talking about like things we want to see. So I sure hope Moon Knight is coming back in some yeah. fashion. But yeah, if Stephen was his way to protect himself 
from, uh, you know, from the pain that was inflicted. Um, Jake may be the opposite. I mean, right. That's to punish the world for what he has experienced. Yeah. So it's going to be kind of, uh, you know, good, bad, bet, or, you know, red, green, yellow. Yeah. So we talked, we've already talked about how we feel the series ended, mm-hmm. but how, how would we compare it to how other, the other Disney at plus MCU shows have ended? Because you're right. There's, there's a mix of good and bad going on here. Um, the penultimate episodes generally tend to be either the penultimate or getting one of the middle episodes tend to be the one that people talk about the most. Mm-hmm. Um, the one, the one exception I can think of is I would, and I, I actually, uh, right before the moon Knight finale aired, I ranked them on my blog. Um, no. for me, their strongest, um, finale is Loki. Yeah. Agreed. Um, because Loki, it literally answered all the questions that we'd had, everything that had been built up mm. and it did it without this big gigantic action scene. Like it's amazing that a conversation between three people could be so engaging for 40 minutes. It was so good. I mean, and introducing us to Jonathan majors as he, who remains slash, many others i'm sure uh yeah that loki kind of is separate i think the series the series finale was so good i agree with the rankings i put moon knight probably um tied for second with wandavision like as something that did resonate wanda's grief mark and steven's like speech coming together you're my superpower and stuff like that and uh, where so now that you've seen it, where where did Moon Knight slot in for you on the on the ranking? Um, I would probably oh, it, it's tough. Um, I might actually slot it in at just looking at it right now. I'm I think I my gut instinct is to slot it in at number four. Mm, okay, with what's um, it, what else is ahead of it? Falcon or Hawkeye or? Um, WandaVision, Hawkeye, and Loki. Okay. Um, so, and I, 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 it does the same sort of things as WandaVision with its, there's a lot of resolution for, you know, Stephen and Mark. There's the big battle, but WandaVision, you know, I think WandaVision's big battle gets a little too big and detracts from the storytelling, but it does give you the resolution of, I need to say goodbye. Yeah. It, those beautiful moments where, Wanda has to, you know, say to Vision goodbye and um, <laughs> it breaks your heart. Um, mm-hmm. But then it also leaves you, you know, with Wanda out in the cabin with the dark hold. Yeah. Um, so it does, it does get you excited about what's going to happen next. Um, and Haw- the reason I bring up on Hawkeye is Hawkeye, I think, does the best at actually just tying the bow. Mm. Apart from Loki. It ties its bow really well. Like the story's resolved, you know. We'll yeah. we'll we'll certainly see more Kingpin, more Hawkeye, and more Kate, and more Yelena, but we probably won't be seeing their paths cross the way they did here. That that issue's done. Mm. Yeah, I, I think Hawkeye resolved well, but it didn't have any of that like turmoil that Moon Knight and WandaVision had to kind of resonate us or to linger with us um i mean what we are really ranking loki aside are payoffs that don't compare to the setups like disney plus has nailed all the setups the payoffs have have uh have floundered here and there but i think that's kind of the point they're all just sort of building up to movies so it seems yeah. What and it's it's funny. Like I think I think now I would uh did I rank it last? Yep. I ranked what if last and you know what? I think that's gonna I'm gonna keep it there forever because you know, we're getting we're getting a little bit into Doctor Strange spoiler territory here, but everyone thought that what if was going to set up Doctor Strange 
And it really doesn't. No. I think what if got, was... Yeah. yeah, I think what if will remain sort of a disconnected thing. It feels like it was sort of conceived of before phase four was sort of outlined. It does have a lot of the phase one, two, and three actors and their participation and stuff like that. So they wanted to put it out, but it feels different. It feels separate. There, there are definitely going to be Easter eggs from what if that you'll watch Dr. Strange and say, I recognize that, but it's like, mm-hmm. you, you know, there are people out there who are saying, this is what you need to watch before you see multiverse of madness. And they include what if, and I was like, you really no. don't like, yeah. you need to watch Dr. Strange, WandaVision. And then like, you know, throw in, throw in the infinity war and end game. And just, just because, you know, you get yeah. more of him. I agree. My wife who I base everything off of because she's more of a casual fan she doesn't even know what what if is. So and she she saw Doctor Strange just fine. So I'm hoping I'm hoping that the that's going to be different in a month in a month from now when Miss Marvel debuts. And I hope that story has a slightly more we'll see if that's the one that'll break the trend and have yeah. the most satisfying conclusion since Loki. Yeah. I think they've got to be seeing the feedback and you know they 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 have a finale problem. And they should be taking action to to solve it. I think what people want is for something concrete to hold on to as an ending. Um, And I think that they went into these other ones thinking that wasn't as big of a deal because they were TV shows. Um, So hopefully they've had now enough time to sort of build those in to the structural inception of the shows. And I think it'll be a, we'll see, it might be different too for the ones that are sort of looked at as event shows like Armor Wars and mm-hmm. Secret Invasion, where those are probably going to be stories that sort of fit into their own six episode chunk and not setting up, hopefully mm-hmm. not trying to set up another event because um, I, I love the MCU, but uh, you know we're, we're getting to the point where you and I were you know, I'll, you and I and almost everyone who's been on the show, we're all old, old enough to remember seeing Iron Man in the theater. Yep. Um, we're going to get soon coming up on a generation that's going to be, you know, turning that that age where they can start watching these movies. And their first one's going to be maybe it'll be, you know, the Marvels next year. And it's going to be like, guess how much history you have to yeah. research, you know, <laughs> to get to where we are now. Like, that's wild to think that. Well, in in the end, the power of a story is a power of your connection to the character. Um, I mean, that lives on through everything. So, I think they get that. So, I'm I I th- I have faith. I do too. I I just think we're yeah we're getting to that point where it's like nothing has ever been this big before. Like <laughs> a, a new a new Star Wars fan who maybe started with um, Force Awakens. Mm-hmm. Only has to go back, and I, yes, I know there's the Clone Wars and all the animated series, but like if you're really just talking about the movies, they just have to go back and watch two trilogies. Yeah, it's not That's that true. much. Yeah. Whereas getting into the MCU, we were actually just talking about this today. One of my coworkers is asking me chronological or um, release order, and for the first time, I say release order. Um, but I was like, well. I'll talk to you in like four months because you have like 40 movies to watch. (laughs) So, Yeah. Um, So yeah, we talked about the finale, but uh, overall, how would you rank? Let's just say it. If you can, how would you rank all, including what if all six series? Oh yeah. I've definitely got Loki one. I completely agree with you. I think, I think it's like one and then a gap. Um, I've got WandaVision WandaVision at two primarily because of the scene you already mentioned which is just her grief and her her goodbye to Vision where Vi- and where Vision says you know I've been a you know I've been this and I've been that who knows what I'll be next you know that there was something really sweet in that um, and then Moon Knight like right behind it I think that Moon Knight also had that level of moment between Stephen and Mark and their understanding on the sands. Mark's decision to leave the reeds 
is giant. Um, so that, that, that was huge, the field of reeds. Then I would say Hawkeye. I, I had a trouble with the battle scenes in Hawkeye, to be honest. They were just like so small scale. And the, the stuff on the ice, I was kind of like, this is getting a little goofy. Um, but I love Kate Bishop, and I'm excited for that. And, of course, love Hawkeye himself or Clint Barton. So they're both Hawkeye, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then um, yeah. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I think, is fifth. And then what if? So I think that's the same as yours. Maybe I'm being influenced by your blog, and I, I'm sorry I can't think for myself, but <laughs> that's <you know>. okay. <laughs> they all they all have their ups and downs. Yeah. Um so how would you rank the shows as a whole? Um mm. from one to six. Because this is this is where I this is where I ended up as a whole. Mm. Um WandaVision is still my favorite show, mm. but Moon Knight, despite its non-ending managed to work its way into second then hawkeye and i know i know loki being fourth is like a heartbreaker for a lot of people but for me loki had an amazing beginning an amazing end and i struggled with the middle mm. but i i do love the book ends of that then falcon and winter soldier despite the fact that i love anthony mackie and sebastian stan so much i had to put it fifth just because it ultimately has a villain problem the further you get into it yeah and then what if just because what if promised a separate story and then just they did they brought it all together in the end and that kind of ruins the to me the concept of what this the whole series was supposed to be about in the first place oh could not agree more about what if that i mean that is so true like i i want to explore stuff without the attachment to anything um yeah i've got loki number one moon knight is number two for me of the overall series um i it's really divided into threes london egypt and then the final two episodes you know with mark and steven so i liked all three fate three sections there so i think i've got it two one division is third oh i really like the beginning of falcon and winter soldier i think i put it fourth and then hawkeye fifth i don't know I'm coming up like a Hawkeye hater here, but I actually loved Hawkeye. So, <laughs> um, and then what if, you know? And to be perfectly clear to everyone watching, yeah, we, there's no hate for these shows. Yeah. There's just, you know, there's just more love for some than others. Yeah. What, what, um, what things do you like the most out of these things you like? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's become incredible incredibly obvious at this point that we're ready for more moon Knight. so i'll just mm -hmm. jump right into it pitch yeah. me your ideal season two my ideal season two is a movie <laughs> we're getting <laughs> off of we're getting off of disney plus and we're going to the big screen like dr strange level budget i want to see all this stuff with the cgi budgets oscar isaac can do it uh layla can do it harold can do it we've got the cast of a movie already I think the next step for Moon Knight is that movie. And I think the thing to tackle is really how in the world does Jake Lockley fit in? We have, we got a plot and we got like, you know, Mark and Steven now need to discover Jake Lockley and that could fracture with them with Layla, you know, so that's, I know it's kind of cheating on your answer, but <laughs> that's my proposal. <laughs> What's yours? <laughs> Well, I'm I'm just going to assume that it's going to be a TV series, continue to be a, a series. Okay. But I I would also love for this to become a movie because I would love for a bigger audience, potentially bigger audience, to get to see it. Um, but it's not too far off from what you just pitched. Literally, mine word for word is: Mark and Stephen must attempt to wrestle the Moon Knight mantle from Jake, who is proving overzealous in mm -hmm. his devotion to Konshu. That sort of same idea of like oh yeah like yeah we need to get this power we need to get this power back and we need to get this guy under control because it's i don't i don't want to necessarily jump the gun and say that jake is evil but it's definitely obvious from his one scene that he has his moral compass is not as mm -hmm. it, it it points towards you know a lack of empathy yes and we've seen conchu definitely has 
you know, a distinct, he, I mean, what does he call it? Like, like you little bug or whatever. Like yeah. he's, he's not understanding the human experience that well. And so if Jake is trusting Conchu, yeah, that's going to spill out. Yeah. He calls Layla a bug and he constantly calls Steven the idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the idiots in charge. Come on, Conchu. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we are, we are ready for more moon nights. Hopefully something that will sort of pick up from where the series has left off and give us some sort of sense of closure for what just happened while also yes. pushing things forward. Yeah. Miles, Disney plus. What? Oh, sorry. Disney plus and, oh, I, and Oscar Isaac, who have certainly listened this far, get it done. <laughs> what are your final thoughts for moon Knight? I feel like we, we covered the things that I really wanted to talk about which was the brilliant performances of Oscar Isaac, but also of Arthur Harrow, of, of Ethan Hawke, and, and of Layla. Um, so that the thing that I take away the most is those three char- characters now a part of you know, the MCU and my world, and I just want more of them. The series itself, the episodes itself, I think was good, not great. Um, I think we kind of fizzled at the end, but I was still happy with the things they did, especially knowing their limited budget. I'm still happy with it. So I think we covered it. What what about you, Ben? Yeah, that that covers a lot. I think uh, they took a huge risk with this Mm. one, just saying, one, here's a character that general audiences really don't know. We're going to go a little bit darker. And we're going to completely disconnect from everything else. That's not their MO. And that is a huge part of the reason that Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke signed on is they didn't want to be part of something that was just another you know, piece of a big puzzle. They wanted to have their own puzzle. Now they've had their own puzzle. Maybe they can start to connect a little bit more as they go on. But the important thing is um, I do think that audiences – did connect with this show. And I do think they are ready for more. So uh, Marvel, Disney, uh, let's have some more. Yeah. I, they kind of did it. They, they created it, but they, and by did it, I mean, they set us up to love these characters. What they did not do is Ethan Hawke and Oscar Isaac's idea of a isolated show. I mean, that is not what this is. (laughs) All right. So it is time for some trivia. So Miles, you are currently, you are on the board at one. Uh, Oh, good. (laughs) Who's up out in front is Jalen and Travis are still, are still far ahead of everyone else at four, but this is your chance to uh, move up a little bit. So question is, where did Moon Knight's premiere among viewers? I phrased that poorly, didn't I? Uh, Where did Moon Knight's premiere um, among its viewership rank among its fellow Marvel shows? As in, how many, uh, it's premiere, you get what I'm talking about, right? (laughs) Uh, How many people watched it versus the other ones on the first episode? So, so does it rank first, second, fourth, or fifth? Hmm, let me think this through. Let's see. Couldn't have been more than an actual Avenger. I'm going to say second. Well, congratulations. That is yes. correct. It actually tied with uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier for 1.8 million views within the first five days. The first, this should come as no surprise, is Loki. Yeah. I <laughs> Like the villain of Avengers on a TV show, I knew that had to be number one. Too many yep. people know who that is. And, and just like Oscar Isaac, Tom Hiddleston. Yep. All right. Well, that is our episode for the week. Episode 44, talking about Moon Knight. Next week, the plan is to talk about Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. One of the biggest films of the year already after only three days. And uh, for me personally, finally, a Marvel horror movie. And finally some love for my favorite hero. So that's going to be it. 
Miles, thank you for joining me on this episode. Thank you. And uh, yeah, everyone, uh, if you uh, if you feel safe getting out there to see your movies, get out there. Stay masked for now. It's still uh, it's still a weird world. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, have an excellent day.